Malagelo Boy, thank you tonight. Now, Gurreli Executive Mayor Mzwandile Masina delivered his last State of the City address for his term as the city's mayor on Wednesday. He highlighted the achievements made under his administration and commended the NC led coalition as the best for the people for this country and for Gauteng. Well, today he joins me now in the studio as we unpack the state of Egrulin. Mayor, good evening and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. I'm um, happy to be here. Have you sharpened your voice? Are you ready to go on radio? I mean, you had made a commitment <laughs> to my colleague that <laughs> when you find time, yeah. uh, that is if you don't come back yeah. into office, uh, <laughs> you might consider a career in broadcasting. I think uh, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, so I'll be looking for adverts everywhere. <laughs> well, Mayor, I mean, uh, you are, of course, in a, in a coalition government, and you have been for, for the last five years. Um, looking at um, what you have managed to achieve, let's start by asking you, what is your feeling about our bureaucracy? Do you think it's uh, inhibiting? Do you think it, it supports the work that you... Uh, would want to do in delivering value to the people of the city? Well, uh, I think uh, it's about uh, building an understanding uh, between the political leadership as well as the administrative leadership, but also is to appreciate uh, the laws of the country and uh, make sure that you work around them uh, uh, without actually <coughs> uh, seeking to break uh, uh, any laws. So I think uh, for me, uh, it's a dynamic relationship between between uh, between uh, in our case between the three layers of government because uh, we, we have uh, the, the legislature which uh, is run by the speaker, we have the executive that is run by myself and we have an administration that is run by Dr. Imogen Mashazi. But for, the, for government to work, uh, the, these three institutions in one uh, must really talk to each other from time to time but also they must safeguard each other in order to ensure that um, uh, there is no maladministration in the process. Yeah. And you're one of the <coughs> metros held by the Auditor General as having uh, traversed that particular aspect very well as far as creating stability between the political and the administrative. The CFO, for example, having been in office, I think, five years, uh, hasn't changed. Uh, or the, 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 city, well, uh, yeah, the we, city manager. Yes, the city manager has been yeah. in office for five, five years. years uh, yes. He hasn't changed. And the, uh, the CFO... Um, I think is in office now for almost three years. Yes. Uh, so we really have tried to stabilize the institution, and uh, we are happy that uh, over the past four years we've not had any irregular, wasteful, and fruitless expenditure. Yeah. Uh, we've been just working on some of the technical reports of the AG to make sure that we get uh, the all-round clean audit. And I'm confident that um, the work that we've been doing at some point before we leave office, I'm sure we will be able to have those good news at some point. We had some uh, clean audit on performance information in another year. We had clean audit on financial information. So <coughs> now um, we have to deal with issues of compliance so that uh, all those three aspects is what will give you the clean audit. Uh, we've worked very hard uh, as a city and we're confident as uh, the AG is coming again uh, on the 31st of March to present his report. We're crossing our fingers that we <coughs> will have a much better audit uh, yeah. than compared to the past four years. I, I, actually, I'm saying that because you managed to successfully then do that, create that stability, traverse the, the balance between keeping the laws, keeping the collision happy and, and uh, being able to do your work. So if we look at, for example, the value that you have added, let's take the um, uh, uh, South African Human Rights Commission report to start with. When you came in in 2016, the informal settlement was 18.7%. You're coming out now the informal settlement is still 18.7%. You didn't move the needle. <coughs> Look, um, the, the story there is different. The condition in the informal settlement has improved. Uh, in fact, that report that was released on the 23rd of, of, uh, of March uh, praises Eguruleni for the work that we've done. The, we've improved conditions in the informal settlement. For instance, you'll remember that which people termed a scandal at the time when I came in of the chemical toilets. Uh, we now, uh, you know, one toilet was used by 10 families, which in our view was indignity. And if we did not stand firm, we uh, would have just um, went on with the headline and failed to understand that we must give dignity to our people. But we stood firm uh, as all as, uh, as government, <coughs> and now we have almost every second hour or so it's got its own toilet. Uh, and we are now looking at an alternative um, uh, at an alternative form of sanitation so that we can give dignity. But equally, um, we have 119 informal settlements. 40 of them have now been electrified, uh, <coughs> and that it was not there in the past. 
and 46 have been re-blocked, meaning that we've got six more that um, can, uh, we can go in and put electricity when the budget agrees. Uh, we've extended the, 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 tap, uh, the, te the, the piped water across uh, and we've created streets, so emergency services can now go into some of the informal settlement. The challenge that we are facing is that some of the informal settlements are located um, in the privately owned land, so we can't go there put government services, so we must look at alternatives. Uh, so if you were to look at those that uh, invaded, uh, if you like, uh, uh, government-owned land, mm. uh, we've, we've been able to do almost 80% of the work. The condition is different now than, than it was. Okay, let's, 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 let's stay there for a little bit. So you're saying when you, when you came in, the 119 were there and you <coughs> improved the conditions in which they, 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 they are in. How many of those people would you say left that space and actually moved into proper housing? So when you came in, the backlog, for example, was 288,000. Yes. Um, um, you are talking now in your state of the uh, city address of a potential 210,000. It's a potential. You yes. did not build that. It's a potential, <clears throat> right? Uh, how far did you chip at that uh, 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 backlog, for example? Well, the housing delivery has been accelerated in our term of office. Um, you know, you can possibly combine the two, two past previous terms and look at the records in terms of uh, uh, human settlement de uh, uh, delivery. This term around, we've delivered about 42,000 uh, housing units uh, together with 26,000 uh, uh, service stands that uh, has been given to our people. The reason why uh, that number of 210 potential is critical is that we are running almost over 30 housing projects in the city. And then uh, before you can build the top structure, you need uh, bulk infrastructure. So that 210 basically gives you a sense that uh, at any given time, if the province uh, give us our allocation of the top structures, we, we can tomorrow build the additional 100, uh, 210 houses, uh, which is unprecedented. So whatever happened uh, uh, as, as, as we end the term of office, we are proud that uh, the backlog uh, in the, over the next five years we really will, come, will be able to come closer. The other thing that we are beginning to emphasize is that um, beyond just giving these RTP houses, uh, we must give people land uh, and service that land and make sure that our people can be able uh, to build their own homes because um, a home is a dignity for every human being. So we believe that uh, there is, uh, we've made quite considerable progress uh, in ensuring that uh, our people are getting houses. So the number 42,000 might sound small in five years, but the bureaucracy between the province, national and ourselves, on how we could, uh, we could do that, I think that we've done very, very well. Yeah. Is that a target that you set for yourself? Well, no, I mean, when you come in and you see well, that... that, 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 uh, that uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what the report also said, that you are created planning, by the way. So we're going to do, uh, give uh, a due where it's due, right? Yes. Uh, South African Human Rights Commission said, no, you, you've got great plans. Uh, that you do put in place. But we, at de least we deliver as well. We deliver right? but, but I'm just saying, as a part of the plan, yes. I mean, would you plan looking <coughs> at the backlog that you have to just build 46,000? Look, um, the, the backlog is there and has been there historic, historically. Uh, I also don't want to present myself as a magician. Uh, you know, we've got to, as, you, as we started, follow all the due processes so that you don't uh, build 100,000 houses uh, and then tomorrow you are told that the land is not suitable, uh, this and that, or you've not done sufficient geo studies and so on and so on. So it was important that we set a target of 100,000, and I'm saying to you that we did not achieve this target. However, we've performed much better than we did in previous terms uh, as the ANC-led government. We'll come back in a moment. I'll touch that on, 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 on a little bit more as well as, the, as, as getting a sense of what the challenges are uh, in the city of Egurulen as far as building houses is concerned. Your con of course, you can be a part of the conversation as well on Twitter at Newsroom 405. Send us your WhatsApp questions and comments to 072-110-5584. The Newsfeed Late Night continues in a moment. Welcome back. You're live with us on the news feed late night and our conversation continues with the executive mayor of the city of Ekuruleni. And of course, uh, your thoughts tonight on Twitter at Newsroom 405. You can WhatsApp your questions and your comments, 072-110-5584. Before the break, the mayor mentioning at least some of the work that he has done on the, on the housing front. I said, we'll come, we'll come back to, to that, mayor. And I, I wanted to talk about, I mean, already you're saying 64% are housed in the city, 9.6, um, <coughs> or rather 9% at least in backyards, 18.7 uh, in informal settlements, which are now uh, with a level of electricity uh, and, 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 and running water. 
the, the challenge that was, uh, for example, picked up by the district uh, uh, model assessment yes. is that uh, uh, much of the city is on dolomitic land uh, and very difficult for you uh, to then build houses uh, on that uh, uh, type of, of, of land. So what innovation did you bring to be able to house the people? Well, uh, we have worked through our city planning department to look at the alternative on how we can reinforce the structures, uh, working with the Council for Geoscience. Uh, there are lots of projects now where we are actually reclaiming almost uh, 4,000 hectares of pieces of land <coughs> has been reclaimed and we will be able to, to develop in those. And different studies have been done and I think that I'm quite happy that uh, we, we've appreciated the condition, the difficult condition that we're facing and we're beginning to come up with a mechanism uh, to deal with those issues. And I think I must say that it is not easy because it is very, very expensive uh, to create a concrete foundation on a dolomatic piece of land, uh, especially for structures that we're building. So uh, I'm happy with the progress we've made in, the, in, in that space. Let's talk water then. I mean, the <coughs> uh, uh, numbers point to 60% pipe water uh, for those who are living inside a house. Uh, others uh, have got to get their water from a community stand from uh, inside a yard or from a community tap. But further than that, 4% uh, of uh, those who live in the city uh, experience water interruption at least once a week. Uh, and you've got another 38% that never experience uh, water interruptions. What's going on there? What's the disconnect? Well, uh, we have embarked on a program to build new reservoirs. As you know, that we get our water from rainwater. Um, we, we currently have about um, uh, 20 or so reservoirs <coughs> across the city. We are building additional 29 reservoirs to ensure the security of supply uh, for water. It is an unprecedented uh, pr a project that we are running over the past five years. In fact, um, five of those are complete, uh, another 10 will be complete and the rest uh, will be completed uh, in the new term. So these are kind of things that we have been able to do, appreciating uh, the difficulty that we are facing. The city is growing, uh, you know, it's, it's, the population is now at about 4 million. So it's important that uh, we ensure security of supply of water, of energy, because those are basic necessities for all human beings. We have pushed uh, very hard uh, the, the stats that we received from our Department of Water, that almost 85 of the people, 85% uh, of the people are receiving water from, uh, from their own homes, but others obviously in the informal settlement uh, and so on are still de depending on communal taps and so on. What we have done, as I said, in the informal settlement, we've ensured that uh, if uh, in a settlement of 5,000 people, there were, uh, let's say, average of uh, uh, 20 taps, we've increased them to 20, uh, just to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the, the reach is much more uh, uh, quicker uh, for our people, but also they don't spend a lot of time queuing uh, for water. But we have to look into all those things and, 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 and ensure that in future the planning must take into account that uh, people come to our province uh, in Gauteng, especially our metro and other metros, I'm sure when you speak to them, they will tell you the same story that we've got to plan beyond the numbers that we have planned for the future in order for us to cater for, 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 for these human, basic human needs uh, that, that, like water and electricity. Yeah. Talk electricity mm -hmm. as well. I mean, I don't know. I've got two numbers. The one number says when you came in, 10% uh, were not uh, uh, connected to electricity. The Human Rights Commission number says 20% are not connected uh, to electricity. Did the number grow in between? Did the <coughs> I know the population, of course, has grown yeah. uh, from 3.5 to 3.8 million people. Uh, did you get a, a rise in the number of people requiring electricity? Well, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know uh, the stats where and, or disagree with the stats. But what I know is that uh, we have considerably reduced the number of people who do not have access to electricity. That is why I spoke about the 40 informal settlements that previously did not have the electricity. In the informal settlement, just to give you a sense, uh, there's almost 164,000 households where almost 600,000 people are residing there. And I'm saying that uh, in terms of the advances we've made, quite a number, substantial number of ho households have now received electricity. So I don't want to sit and uh, defend whether the number has grown or it's up. But when we came in, the number was about 10%. So I would, I would like to believe that the number should, fight, should be much more lower than that. Yeah. But obviously, we, we could engage uh, because uh, this report, as you say, uh, of the Human Rights Commission, we could sit down and engage with them to see uh, where are they, uh, but also give them our own statistics to just provide the sense of how far we've been able to go. My sense as the executive mayor 
is that we've done very well uh, to reduce uh, the, the, the number of people who do not have access to electricity. Yeah. Profiling the, the economic aspects of, of, of the city, right? Uh, um, the bulk of it comes from, well, it's supposed to come from manufacturing, but it did drop significantly. Yes. Now you're looking more of a bulk of it coming <coughs> from uh, community services and government services uh, actually making a bulk of, of, of the economy. But uh, uh, the reason I'm raising that is because only 1% of our economy focuses on, on electricity. Why, why, why such a low percentage if uh, you're seeing the city is growing uh, and we should be at least investing in some projects that would ensure uh, security of, of energy? Look, we, we, we are the first city to have uh, gone out on the, uh, uh, to look for alternative uh, energy. Uh, we have about 46 uh, people who have uh, been contracted by the city to look at different sources of energy because our intention is to take 10% of the grid from ESCOM. Now that the Minister of Minerals and Energy has given the green light, uh, we are finalizing our processes in council and as well as NERSA so that uh, we can forge ahead with that particular project. So I'm convinced that uh, uh, we, we have done uh, very well and fast. In fact, uh, the load shedding uh, schedule, uh, I've got a lot of friend, friends here in Johannesburg. Uh, if we were to compare with other uh, areas, uh, it's much better because we're able to to control because of some additional capacity that we've built, especially for all the paying customers, the industries, and so on. I must just say that the, the, the set store of energy is around cable theft um, and, and the illegal connections. These are the things that are, are really, really dragging the city back because uh, when there's cable theft, it means the money man, meant for maintenance must be diverted now uh, to replace uh, a cable that have been stolen and so on and so on. Yeah. But also the, the you know, the, the continuous illegal connection in some of the er areas, especially the informal settlement that we have not connected, is a major issue. But the good story is that uh, the informal settlement where we've connected, people are buying electricity, we are beginning to see revenue when we thought we were solving a social problem. So I'm quite in encouraged uh, with that kind of statistics. The 20, is the 2019-2020 audit is not telling that story, though. It's a little bit worrying. In fact, that, that audit says um, uh, you're, you're worsening your collectability of debt uh, and uh, you're, you've reduced uh, your non-revenue water uh, set up and unaccounted for electricity is also uh, a challenge. Yes, remember that the, the non-revenue water happens uh, when uh, there is leaking pipes and, and we don't act and people are stealing water to... Uh, to, to, to build, to do construction, and they don't pay for it. The non-revenue electricity happens when, uh, uh, you know, people are stealing electricity and uh, were unable to, uh, to go look into the meters and so on and so on. Um, uh, those numbers, we've kept them almost at the national standards. Uh, and uh, we've, we were just worried in the last quarter, we've looked into the numbers, it was quite a bit worrying with some few percentages, but overall, uh, I think that uh, we've kept uh, the numbers uh, in a much more acceptable levels uh, in the city. Yeah. The question that is raised also of um, uh, the non-payment of suppliers on time because of, of course, your inability to collect the debt. Yes, uh, I think I must say that the advent of uh, COVID has really created a, a situation where we have to manage the payment of invoices, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we play between 80 and 20 uh, at any given time to make sure that there is cash reserves because uh, it will be dangerous to take all the municipal money, uh, give it to service provider, then you are unable to pay for your bulk services like uh, energy, uh, like water, you can pay for your workers and all those things. So we've got to balance. Uh, the, it's a new situation and uh, we are making all our service providers to understand. But what we are striving for is to continuously ensure that all our service providers are paid in 30 days uh, at any given time. We just rotate them uh, in terms of those. But uh, fortunately, we also had to go back to council to, uh, to, re to review our budget and revise it uh, downwards, uh, given the reality that uh, uh, people have lost jobs, people uh, the firms were not working. Uh, we've lost almost 1.6 billion uh, in, 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 in income as a result of COVID. All these things are re a reality. Uh, that has confronted us in, in recent times. But uh, the past uh, three, four years, uh, that situation uh, did not okay in our city. We were mm -hmm. always uh, honoring uh, almost all those. But what for me is comforting is that uh, 
uh, we are able to pay for these bulk services and we are able to provide services to our people. And where there are challenges, uh, we are able to react in time to resolve them. And I must say that, uh, you know, the, the, the past five years of being in local government has made me appreciate uh, the detailed work that gets to happen and the processes. So other people is easy. When, you, when there is a pothole, you think uh, that you can just call the mayor, the pothole <laughs> is resolved. There is all sorts of uh, administrative process that must occur yeah. in order for that to be, to be taken, taken care of. What we have what, what ensured is that uh, at any given incident that is reported, uh, at least uh, in less than 24 hours, we must be able to, to resolve that particular challenge. And it doesn't mean we don't have challenges, but uh, all the surveys that have come over the past three years have consistently from, uh, from uh, uh, GC, GCRO have consistently said that the quality of life in our city has improved. And uh, when you speak to different citizens, there are those that will consistently complain, yeah. uh, even when they're in the RTP house, there is a light outside. Uh, but we, we do understand that ours is to provide service, not to complain or compare ourselves with the citizens. Yeah, let's talk about that <laughs> when we come back, because, uh, I mean, that, that very same question of the quality of life has improved. 2010, you had 1.4 million people living in poverty. Currently, there are 1.7 million. I'm sure you've got an explanation uh, of why that is. And um, according to uh, uh, this report, <coughs> it says we are the second most intense. I'm saying we are because I come from Egurulene, by yeah. the way. Uh, we are the second most intense in the province as far as uh, the uh, number of people living uh, in poverty. We'll speak to the uh, mayor when we come back on that question at News 405 or WhatsApp your questions and your comments to 072-110-5584. We're back in a minute. Happening now on News in Africa, Channel 405. It is your news feed late night. Thanks for staying on. In conversation tonight with the mayor of the city of Egrulen, I see lots of your WhatsApp messages coming through tonight with questions for the mayor. Well, keep them coming at Newsroom 405. WhatsApp your questions and comments to 072-110-5584. We'll get to them in just a moment. So before the break, mayor, as I was saying, I mean, if you look at the <coughs> numbers, 2010, 1.4 million people living in poverty, currently 1.7 million. In fact, we are the second most intense uh, in terms of uh, the province when you look at people living in poverty. Well, uh, two things have occurred. Firstly, is that there is uh, uh, lots of, lots of, lots of immigration into our city. And secondly, uh, due to COVID, lots of people have lost jobs and uh, we've got to find a way for our economy to grow in order for us to respond uh, to the challenges that is facing us. Uh, so I think that... Um, uh, probably is a fair assessment of, 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 the re of the current realities. Hence, we have launched a massive uh, economic uh, development strategy to really uh, firstly revitalize our, 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 our manufacturing industry, but secondly, uh, to then uh, launch uh, a, a new development around the Eretropolis, uh, which is around freight and logistics. And I'm sure you will appreciate that you've seen a lot of factories coming up there mm -hmm. and are helping us to create quite a number of needed jobs in our city. The, the, the problem will always be there because people who come from rural areas, you cannot say you stop people from moving to, into, into these cities. So we've got to create, grow our economy, create a number of opportunities for our people, both in government but uh, most importantly in the private sector, in order for us to ensure that uh, we reduce that kind of number of people who are suffering. It's, it's, it's been said there's a whole lot of potential for the city in the transport sector <coughs> for growth that is. Of course manufacturing it used to be known as the workshop of, 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 of the country. Yeah. Uh, that needs to be revived but there is potential also in the primary sector uh, when we're talking of agriculture and agro processing uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Let's talk uh, at, at the a transport level, what you have managed to uh, to achieve at that level. There is one pro project called the Prasa Gibela Rail uh, uh, Monetary Plant. It set a target in 2015 to 2025 of 600 trains and 3,500 train carriages. How much of that did you manage to deliver? Well, uh, I visited the Prasa Gibela factory for the second time. Uh, the first time the, I went uh, with the former president, we did a short turning. Uh, when I returned, uh, uh, they, were, they had just completed train number 58, which has been delivered to Prasa. Uh, I was impressed with the quality, with what I've seen, but most importantly, I've, I was impressed with the ability to do localization uh, with regard to those trains. And I, I think that uh, 
we must comment that particular project and what the work that they are doing there and maybe make a call. I know that um, it's a work of Minister Mbalula. Uh, that please don't burn those trains. Uh, it's hard work. <laughs> it's hard work uh, that has uh, that has come out, and I believe that uh, they will meet the target. And uh, when we met with the management, they were telling us about the the expansion strategy because uh, they they are building local capabilities. It is uh, the kids of Tuduza, Guatemala, Zakane who are working in those uh, in that in that factory. Yeah. Uh, it will be important, therefore, to 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 expand beyond the contract they have with Prasa to look into the continent. So I was happy that uh, they have a strategy to expand to the continent and uh, ourselves uh, using the advantage of the airport to uh, further answer your question. That, uh, we, that's why we've taken a decision that freight and logistics should be our uh, new focus as a city uh, to leverage uh, on the advantage of the airport. Hence, you see those factories along the R21 a corridor that, that are coming up. Yeah. Speaking of Togoza uh, and Tsakane rather and Duduza, the last time we met we were at the Guatema uh, Economic Development Program mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. was a huge infrastructure investment yeah. Yeah. which you created uh, for, for, for the city. What did you expect should happen there and what has actually uh, happened in as far as enterprise development is concerned? Well, uh, we've run a number of programs, not just in Guatemala, across the city around enterprise development, uh, around training, around mentoring, uh, around skills, uh, uh, around skills development, and uh, but also partnerships with the uh, progressive institutions like the NEF, uh, uh, like the NYDA, uh, to really try and bring these resources closer to our people. As you know, that as government, we have limited resources. Um, uh, for enterprise development. So we have been working with uh, uh, CEDA, CIFA, and all those institutions to make sure that we bring those services closer to the people. So uh, the, the hubs that you are talking about, uh, actually that's where we invite those uh, entities to be there, but also we provide space for local uh, entrepreneurs uh, who are interested uh, at a much more reasonable rate so that they're able to do their own businesses. Yeah. How many of them are you impacted? I mean, the last time we spoke, you spoke about township economy, right? And we know we talk about Zakane, Duduza, Tembiza, all those places. Nabo Makenika, who fix cars uh, there. Uh, you've got Abu Mama who cook. You've got uh, a range of taverns. And you've got um, those, those are the type of businesses that make up the, the township economy. How are you formalizing those businesses? Well, uh, we are doing a lot of work, as I'm sure you know that there is a bill that is coming from the Gauteng government, which is going to regulate uh, uh, the, 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 that, that sector that has been identified. So um, in the meantime, we have been doing a lot of registration, support, uh, but also giving advice in terms of how those businesses should be run. And we've uh, really massively focused uh, a lot around uh, the issues of training and mentoring. And, and I must say that... Um, Obviously, during COVID, businesses like the Shibins, uh, you know, they went down because, uh, you know, there was no sale of alcohol and so on and so on. Uh, but they were seeing uh, a, a slight improvements now across the township economies, and I, I believe that uh, that's the anchor uh, for the for the new post-COVID economy that we must build. We want to have more entrepreneurs who can employ at least three to five people. Uh, doing their own businesses because to depend only on government and to depend on private sector has proven to be difficult. Firms have lost uh, lots of revenue. They've retrenched almost two million according to the Stats SA. So this is a reality that we need more entrepreneurs. So we need more opportunities. Uh, all these hubs must be created, but also there must be a program of government to ensure that we are able to support those. I was looking at the figures uh, of the actual procurement that uh, has occurred. Uh, for local entrepreneurs and I was quite encouraged that uh, we, we've made a uh, considerable progress and I hope that those who get those opportunities they're able to expand and employ others. Out of forward. the 310 billion GDP of the city, how much of that is in that uh, sector? Well, uh, it's aggregated in percentages uh, um, in the main. So I've looked into different numbers, uh, you know, for the youth, for the women, uh, for military veterans and so on and so on. Obviously, it will never be sufficient because, uh, you know, uh, because of unemployment, we've got uh, a number of people looking for opportunities, so there is pressure uh, in government. That is why, for instance, one of the problems we have now, uh, you know, on the 30%, uh, which is supposed to be a set-aside, is uh, proving to be a very uh, difficult point, uh, point 
uh, because everybody just uh, comes into the project and looking for 30 percent uh, without wanting to put an effort to it but there are those um, who rightfully uh, go claim that 30 uh, percent but get to work uh, and, 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 and support those uh, pro projects in the township so we want to encourage our people to make, ensure that there must be no lawlessness uh, in us uh, wanting to look for opportunities so that we are able to en ensure that we don't waste the time and infrastructure that must be developed in order to assist us in the townships. So that's what we've been able to do over time. So many of the clinics we've, that we've built, um, we've actually built about five clinics during our term of office, <coughs> uh, about ten libraries during our term of office, about uh, five uh, um, uh, fire stations and so on all those infrastructure including the swimming pools and so on and so on as we build them uh, we need uh, small businesses to access opportunities but also um, you know the disruption of public infrastructure is a problem that we are facing as government especially uh, you know people just dig every roads as, as and when there's a there's a protest uh, they remove the pavements uh, they bring down the robots and so on and so on beautiful work that we've done in Tembisa all the Beautiful lights when we're entering Tembisa has been brought down. Yeah. For what? I don't know. And that infrastructure <laughs> is, is actually in, public in fact, money. I wanted to ask you that because <clears throat> I looked at the numbers. What's happening in the Kempton Park area? Nokem Park, I think, is the highest as well. Tembisa in particular, when you look at the crime statistics, they're always higher than the rest uh, of, of the Ekuruleni uh, area. Well, I think uh, it's the, the size of the population. Of the, the north is one of the biggest uh, area of, of Eguruleni. And uh, there is a, a mixture of, uh, you know, uh, people there. And uh, we've looked into the statistics, uh, you know, the crime of hijacking, uh, you know, uh, of uh, uh, business crime yeah. and all those things. And most importantly in Kempton Park, the problems of drugs, uh, is unprecedented and we really are focusing in that era in ensuring that uh, we can uh, clamp down uh, the syndicates that are operating there. There is almost a takeover of Kempton Park um, um, by foreign nationals and uh, uh, they are not making it easy and uh, we know that we must all coexist but you know you, you can't have people who are coming from somewhere taking over the entire town uh, displacing almost everyone there and activities that are ha happening there uh, and the reports that we get, uh, you know, including murder, uh, is coming up in that specific era. So we're quite concerned, and we've directed our law enforcement agencies to be looking into, do, into those areas to ensure that um, we can bring down, bring down the numbers of, of crime uh, that is occurring in, in, in the north. All right, let's talk then about the issue that you've just mentioned now. Let's track um, unemployment, right, from 2016 to today. Um, it is... I mean, it started at 30.6%, went up 33.6% in 2017, and it dropped again in 2018 to 31.2%, was a slight up uh, in uh, 2019. So, uh, more people are unemployed since 2016 up until now. Yes, because more people have arrived and more people have been retrenched. And uh, more, as a result of that, more people are unemployed, and that's a reality. Uh, but what is good, um, um, a story that is not often told by many, uh, is that uh, we took a conscious decision, as you know, that the education is a mandate of provincial and national government. We took a decisive decision in 2016 that other than having unemployed and unemployable youth, let's rather educate them. To date, we've paid about $470 million and we've taken to universities and TVH colleges 9,000 youth uh, that is ready for different employments. Others uh, have been taken abroad, they've come back, others are employed. And the, the, the situation that we're creating, we want even those that are unemployed to have hope, to have skills, so that when opportunities arise, uh, we, we don't look back and say we don't have the, the skills. So that's a story that has not been told in terms of the work that we've been, uh, we've been able to do. But also in government, wherever there are opportunities, we're one of the cities that have said that uh, for those who are returning from universities, uh, they don't need experience uh, for low entry jobs uh, in our city. But obviously, we, c we can only take so much, as you know, that the numbers of unemployment is very, very mm. uh, huge in our, in our city. So that's a challenge that we are facing. But also, I'm saying that we are not folding our hands as these statistics are being presented. We are coming up with an alternative to try and make sure that uh, we better the lives of, uh, of the people of Eguruleni. Speaking of employment in the city of Eguruleni, Mayor, 18.49% vacancy rate. What's happening there? 
especially in the <coughs> environment, finance and admin uh, spaces? Well, I don't think that statistic is correct uh, in the main. Um, that uh, is the statistic coming from the uh, profile analysis of the yeah. district model. Yeah, I'm saying that I don't think it is correct because remember, you also need to talk to those who are running the system to understand. Um, what I know as a matter of fact, if you are talking about vacant and funded jobs, uh, we're far less than 15% uh, or so in terms of that. And the reason why uh, we've slowed down um, is that um, we have a situation now where, where only one third of the workforce must be at work. So if you hire people now during COVID, what, what are you trying to do? So rather, we've made those savings to make, make sure that we look after uh, the workforce that we currently have. Uh, we don't have a crisis. I saw a statistics of 33% in NH, which I inquired about when I was in council today. Uh, it was proven not to be true. Uh, so it is possible that those who did the study might have looked into our structure uh, pre-2017, uh, because in 2017 we rationalized and we made sure that um, only the, uh, the, 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 the required jobs uh, 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 would remain in the structure. So we don't have such a high percentage of, uh, of vacancies in our city. All right, Mayor, staying on, on with us and we are taking your questions when we come back next. At Newsroom 405, what's up your questions and comments? 072 as we wrap up this conversation. All right, welcome back. You're with us here on uh, the news feed late night and uh, in conversation tonight with uh, the mayor of the city of Ekurileni. He gave his state of the city address. Uh, he would been, he's been in administration now for five years and that was his last in this administration. But we're looking back at what has been achieved and the value that has been added for the people of the city. On Newsroom Africa, channel 405 at Newsroom 405 on WhatsApp 072-110-5584. This is what you're asking tonight. Ntatemu Peme saying... Mr. Mayor, all is well and all, but what is being done regarding the foreign nationals occupying RTP houses illegally? Well, um, there, there are two things that are happening. Firstly, I must explain the law. Uh, according to South African law, there is no foreign nationals who qualifies to get a house. Uh, but uh, we've seen a lot of instances where South Africans who get their houses, they sell them to foreign nationals. And, and we are now looking into together with the province on how best to prevent that in terms of the, the title deed documents uh, so that it is not allowed. And it is happening even in, in the townships where we come from. You know, a garage at home, uh, my mother just uh, brings a foreign national to open a shop. Uh, it becomes a challenge. So because we've agreed to coexist, uh, these are the challenges that, that, that is facing us. But I can assure all the citizens that there is no, uh, not a, there is not a single house that gets to be allocated initially so to are, the foreign national. Are, are you saying then they are able to transfer the title deed? Is, is, is that doable? Not really. They are not transferring the title deed, but they, 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 you know, they move out and go to a check uh, in exchange for money. So I don't know uh, those kind of arrangements, but we are, not, uh, we are not allowing any foreign national to then have the right to the title deed. But what is difficult for us to police uh, is what you do once you get an RTP house. Yeah. Do they come back into the system? Because that's the other thing. I mean, for example, we were talking yesterday about uh, officials, public officials who applied for the 350 grant. Uh, they were only able to be picked up once the alarm was raised. So are people able to get the house, have a title deed, but want to go into the queue again? And is there no way of picking that I up? I don't think so, but the, the housing list is administered by the province. But uh, from what I have heard from my MMC is that uh, it is not possible. After you've received a house either in, in KZN or in Pumalang or Eastern Cape, it's not, it's, it's not possible for you in the system because it's administered nationally uh, through provinces. Um, so I don't think it's, it's easy. So perhaps uh, it becomes a, you know, a temporal measure or, or, so, or so because uh, it's not easy for, for, for people to sell title deeds. Joe in Edenvale saying, mm. Mayor, you seem to have cared only for the townships in Ekurileni and not the suburbs. Kempton Park is now under decay uh, and service delivery in Edenvale has been non-existent. Why? Well, uh, it depends uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the approach of the person. We have not abandoned the CBDs. We wouldn't because that's where we get our revenue to service the township. Uh, so I think uh, perhaps uh, uh, it's just a matter of, an, uh, you know, uh, 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 an example uh, that um, one might say it's subjective uh, because we do look after the, 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 the CBDs. Um, one of the reports I stated that, uh, for instance, in Jamestown and in, 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 
Albertin. We are now cleaning at night to make sure the CBDs are clean. Uh, but over and above that, we want to extend that uh, um, uh, service to all the other C uh, CBDs. So we want to appeal, uh, because in the main, the issue of waste in the main is we are culprits as citizens. We want to appeal to each and every citizen to be mindful of the fact that we all need clean environment. Government, we are doing our bit. We've got people that we have hired now who are litter pickers. Uh, we remove waste uh, in, in, in those areas. But we still see it in our townships, uh, uh, dirty, I mean, I mean, the, the CBDs dirty. But the, I don't think that it's a permanent feature in our city uh, because anywhere you go, you, you, see that, you see that occurring. It is not an, a matter of just us ignoring CBDs in favor of, of the townships. We are also doing work in the informal settlement, which is very, very difficult for us to clean. Uh, but we are trying our best uh, through other mechanisms that we've put in place to make sure that our city is clean. Um, the, relatively, I can safely say that uh, compared to other areas, Egurulani is, uh, is not bad. It's not doing, it's not doing badly uh, in that area. We do have uh, uh, hiccups from time to time, and we're able to resolve those and ensure that CBDs are clean. There is no instance where we cannot uh, pick up um, uh, you know, those weekly pickups from uh, waste pickups. We, we do that all the time with the challenges. It becomes a matter of a day or two, and we come back to resolve it. Muzi, as well, uh, getting in touch with us tonight on WhatsApp. I'd like to ask the mayor what is happening with the mega city project <coughs> that was launched <coughs> by the former Minister of Housing, Nindiwe Sisulu, in Duduza. This was five years ago. Uh, to this day, construction has not started. So explain that, mayor. Well, uh, before you can build a house, as I tried to explain, uh, it is a very complex matter. So what we've done there now, the bulk services infrastructure, which is the most expensive aspect of, uh, of, of housing, has now been done. Uh, we are now waiting to uh, start with our top structure. Uh, I'm, I'm just unable to give you the exact date because I don't want to be held accountable. What I, what I know is that we, we are done now with bulk infrastructure. We should be ready to apply in the pro to the province so that we can start with the top structures. All the most difficult uh, work has been done. Uh, that's why uh, when I gave you that number of 210 uh, potential housing unit, I speak of projects like those. I spoke of Louis, uh, uh, Luoport and other mega projects that have a uh, uh, um, All those projects, we have done bulk work, so we are ready to put top structure. But we apply and we compete as, as uh, spheres of government in ensuring that we get proper allocation because uh, the province cannot just yeah. give only a good loan. They must give the city of Johannesburg, let's the city of Tswane, and so on and so on. Let's talk about that proper allocation question. You lost 120 million rands for non-performance. And then we, we gained about 300 million for performance in the subsequent years. What happened in the year that you lost 120 million? Well, uh, it was issues of plannings and, and, and approval uh, that takes long. You know, for, for Wula water use licenses, for EIAs, uh, you know, and all other... Uh, difficult things like uh, the issues of geotex that you were speaking about. Uh, they can delay you. Uh, unfortunately, you only have 12 months between, uh, between July and June uh, to deliver any particular project. If you don't, uh, you forfeit the money and uh, you take it back. In the instance where we gain the money, it's because other cities are going through that, then we, we projects are ready in the city, then we're able to do that. So it's a, it's a matter of, it's an ongoing you know, issue that, uh, that, that we experience in our city. Let's take one from Richard Baker. What about the collapse of Ekuruleni power supply to the major industrial areas of Wadeville and Owl Road, causing companies to lose contracts uh, and uh, some close down? Well, um, we, in the, during the state of, of the city address, um, uh, we have demonstrated in council that almost 283 million have been spent uh, to revive the infra infrastructure. You must remember that the infrastructure there is old, is way too old, and it cannot cope with new technologies and so on and so on. So what we do, we have a, a program where we are ramping up, you know, uh, areas like uh, Jamestown, uh, Al Road. Jamestown Al Road is one area. Uh, Albertin, uh, Albertin Al Road um, uh, in Springs, in Kempton Park, and Boxbeck, and so on and so on. So all day we've de we've demonstrated in council how much we've been able to invest to revive the in infrastructure such that uh, the, 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 there's re reliability. So in Al Road, uh, I can assure you that we've made investment that will turn the situation around uh, uh, in terms of ele electricity supply. Mayor, is it time to take away your phone? But one hour to you on Twitter, like you, you, uh, you, 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 you are heading. Is, 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 is there such a thing that is going on 
uh, as you being a headache <laughs> on Twitter with your views? Yeah, the man who's a headache on Twitter, actually, people don't know. It's not me. It's that guy. <laughs> uh, you know, I was someone, I had my phone during the State of the City's address. Um, so, so my tweet kept on going. So my wife says, how, do, how can you be reading a speech and tweeting? So I just I said, no, I just, uh, when I came back, I said, no, don't do that. So, so always I have to explain that I'm not always on Twitter because I work. Uh, there's a man who's paid to be on Twitter on my behalf. Uh, he's doing the job. Uh, I take the blame sometimes. So it's not, uh, it's not me all the time. Let's talk a little bit then about the politics that, uh, that are going on. And uh, somebody was asking this question earlier on, saying during COVID, the mayor uh, was uh, doing the state <coughs> of the city address, and he talked something about some medication, Inferno Alpha 2B, and you said this thing was a vaccine, and uh, you were willing to use the city's emergency funding to procure this stuff. And have you ever withdrawn that thing? What, what were you saying? What was going no, on? There, there is nothing to withdraw. Sometimes media just creates a hype out of nothing. What I said there in context was that um, because we're, we're seeing this, uh, this thing of, uh, uh, of corona coming, we do have emergency fund. Uh, so I was saying that I have been made aware of interferon alpha 2B, uh, which is a molecule. And then I said that, and then I said if there is any vaccine as it is now, there is Johnson & Johnson, there is uh, Astra, uh, Veneca, uh, Veneca and, 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 and so on. So I was saying that in an event where the city must come in, in to, to, to assist our citizens, we should be able to do so. I did not say it is a vaccine. Uh, so I was mentioning quite a number of things. The only thing that irritated, uh, especially those in the pharmaceutical sector, is that I mentioned that that drug, by the way, was accredited here in the country. Somehow it, it was no longer on the shelf for whatever reason. It's not my story for today. Uh, uh, so, so the problem is that I mentioned Cuba, and I, I upset so many people. Uh, and I, I have nothing to withdraw because the, the, uh, the interferon drug is there it has been used i've read on the news that even the defense they've gone and procure yeah as a city we have not procured it yeah yes. so you are you are saying you you never said no i'm Although saying it was a misspeech it, it and a, they said you said it was a it vaccine was a, it was because that was the big issue no it was a misunderstanding when we used different ways uh, you know we even wrote to the province they said to us no you can't yeah you know so it's it was not a matter of uh, just us talking on our own, not understanding what is a vaccine and so on. And so I'm not a medical person, but at least I know what are the issues. This drug is there, uh, and it was used in different countries, as we know, in Italy and other countries to assist uh, to deal with the issues of COVID. So it was just a, a media created, and, uh, and they thought that they would threaten me. I won't mention the name Cuba. Uh, I, have, I had to go and, re and name my son, my new son, Cuba, uh, <laughs> just in honor of, <laughs> in honor of, the, 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 of, of this great nation that have continued uh, to, to make us proud. They brought uh, over 200 uh, medical doctors in the country to assist us, and we, are, we owe them. Uh, we owe them great, of, uh, great gratitude, and we must appreciate the work that they've been able to do, working together with our own medical uh, team here. It has not been easy. It's not time to create... Um, you know, differences on terminologies. Uh, the drug is there. Uh, you can go Google it. Uh, the drug uh, was used. And the drug has been bought by the army. It has not been bought we, by the we, We'll bring you in to come and discuss the drug because it's got its side effects and whatever else that, that comes with it. But, Mayor, let me appreciate your time. Thank yeah. you very much for coming through to talk to us today. Thank you, thank you. That is uh, the executive mayor of the city of...